Knock, knock. Hi guys. Today we're talking about a type of hair loss called alopecia areata. So hair loss can be a very emotional process. It is not just hair. It is part of your identity, whether it's from stress or attraction or chemotherapy, whether it's an autoimmune disease like alopecia areata, like we're going to talk about today, hair loss can be very stressful. Today, I'm going to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of alopecia areata. This particular type of hair loss or alopecia gained some publicity over the last few years because some public features came out in the media about their hair loss. So if you suffer from this type of hair loss, alopecia areata, you are not alone. In fact, 2% of the American population or 6.6 million people suffer from alopecia areata. And there are many celebrities and public figures that have come out with their story of alopecia areata. In this video, I'll review the causes of alopecia areata, how it progresses and presents, and an update on medications and treatment, both over the counter and prescription. If you're just tuning in, I'm Dr. Abby Waldman. I'm a board certified dermatologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. So let's get started. First, what is alopecia areata? So alopecia areata is an autoimmune disease, meaning the lymphocytes, the white blood cells in the body mistakenly see the hair follicle and think that it's something foreign. It's something that shouldn't be there. And they start to attack the hair follicle. This can affect both men and women of all ages, but it is most common in people under the age of 30, including children. It can present as round or oval patches of hair loss, but it actually can include the entire scalp or any area of hair on the body. Complete scalp alopecia is termed alopecia totalis. And when you've lost all the hair on the body, that is termed alopecia universalis. Sometimes nails can have pitting or ridging. And if you have this can suggest that you have a more severe presentation of alopecia areata. It can present with other autoimmune disorders like lupus and thyroid disease, rheumatoid arthritis, vitiligo, and even just having eczema and allergies is more common if you have alopecia areata. Patients with alopecia areata may have higher rates of depression, anxiety, and may need social and mental health support. So you may already have a diagnosis of alopecia areata, or you may just be experiencing hair loss and be unsure which type it is and kind of suspicious that it may be this type of autoimmune hair loss. Because hair loss can have different types of treatments, it's really important that you get a clear diagnosis. And that may mean seeing your doctor, seeing your dermatologist. Oftentimes the diagnosis can be made clinically, but sometimes you need to get a hair pull test where the doctor will remove some hairs and kind of look at the area. Sometimes you'll even need to do a biopsy to actually check the scalp and see what type of hair loss you're having if it's not a clinically apparent case. Like many other autoimmune diseases, we don't entirely know what triggers it. Sometimes there is a genetic component in that it does tend to run in families, but also environmental factors like stress and infections can kind of trigger the autoimmune phenomenon to occur. So just like other autoimmune disorders, alopecia areata is a chronic condition. Um, often it has relapses, remittance, relapse, remittance. There are a lot of medications available to control symptoms, but there's no cure. There's nothing that you're gonna take, cure the disease, be off of it and, and be done kind of like a bacterial infection per se. This is more like diabetes or lupus where you're gonna be often sort of on and off medications in order to control symptoms. So let's start first on the treatment ladder. Generally, first line is either topical steroids or injectable steroids, where you get steroids injected into the area, the patches of alopecia. This is the case for both kids and adults with disease. Sometimes other topical therapies like topical immunotherapies can be used in order to treat the area. Steroids are generally used because remember, this is your own immune system that's attacking the hair follicle. So you wanna calm down that immune reaction, basically decrease the inflammatory response. And so the steroids are very effective at decreasing that. And then sometimes the hair will just grow back naturally. Sometimes you can use other medications topically like minoxidil that help the hair grow a little bit faster. 
Side effects from topical steroids include atrophy, where you actually get some areas of indentation in the scalp. That tends to happen more with injectable steroids, more so than topical steroids. And of course, there's a possibility that they just don't work. Now, in those cases or in severe cases, sometimes oral prednisone or oral steroids will be used to really calm down the inflammatory response while you start another medication. So oral steroids are never the final treatment. Oral steroids should never be used for really long periods of time because the body can become reliant on them and it really can affect different things inside your body like your sugar levels, your sleep, your weight, and it can affect your organs long-term. So this is a, that would be a short-term solution to kind of taper over into another type of non-steroidal medication. The most common oral or topical medication to kind of transition to from steroids would be minoxidil. So topical minoxidil 5% is used uh, to encourage hair growth after the inflammatory response has been decreased. Oral minoxidil can be used safely, again, to encourage hair regrowth and talk to your dermatologist about side effects of these medications. If your condition is not being controlled by either topical injectable steroids plus or minus minoxidil, it may be worth asking about a referral for a hair specialist, one who is used to managing sort of more severe or recalcitrant cases of alopecia areata. So in the last few years, there's some been exciting FDA approvals of JAK inhibitors. The two that are FDA approved are biracidinib and ruloxanib. And these both are approved in adults and one is approved in children with severe alopecia areata. These do have a number of side effects. This is definitely gonna be a conversation that you have with your dermatologist or doctor about whether the side effects, the risk benefits are worth it. There are some other medications that can be used, again, in situations where you also have very bad eczema or atopic dermatitis. There is a medication that can be used called depilimumab. This can target both your eczema and the alopecia areata. Other immunomodulating medications like methotrexate and cyclosporin can also be considered. Some at-home natural remedies that have been shown in trials to have some effect include rosemary oil and some other oil mixes, and also over-the-counter azelaic acid has been shown to help hair regrowth. Vitamin D levels, zinc, and folate levels have been shown to be lower in patients with alopecia areata, so it may be worth discussing with your doctor whether those are worth testing. Again, vitamin D, folate, and zinc. What to expect when your hair does regrow. Obviously, initially, it's gonna be very short hairs and little patchy hairs. Sometimes it can even grow in a slightly different color, maybe even white, and then transition to the normal color as time goes on. So in conclusion, alopecia areata is a distressing condition. It is really common, but that doesn't make it any easier to go through. With the right treatment, the right doctors, it can be managed effectively. And it's important to see a dermatologist if you think you're having symptoms of alopecia areata in order to get the proper diagnosis and also just to make sure you've evaluated for other autoimmune disorders and that you're getting the right treatment approach. Please subscribe for more videos like this. I'm Dr. Abby Waldman. Be well.